This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. We are the Paradoxical Eight. Bipedal, naked, large-brained, long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves, aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I first got interested in lice um, many years ago when my now 25-year-old son was in elementary school. And he came home with one of those flyers saying that one of the kids in his class had shown up with lice and you know, what sorts of things parents should be on the lookout for. And also included was a flyer with a bunch of what uh, I refer to as sort of fun facts about human lice that I didn't know about. <laughs> so these include the fact that our lice only parasitize humans. So they don't live on cats or dogs or your other pets. You don't have to worry about picking them up from them or transferring them to your pets. So in other words, this means they're obligate parasites of humans, right? They can only live on human hosts. Secondly, they can't survive more than about 24 hours away from the human body. So that means they can't take up residence in your bedding or your clothing or et cetera, and then you know, reinfect you from that sort source. And so I thought, well, if this is true, then what that means is that the spread of lice around the world must have been ac accomplished by the spread of humans around the world. And since human migrations is something that I'm interested in, then maybe by studying lice, we can learn something more about human migrations. But then <laughs> a few years later, when I actually had time to start looking into this in more detail, I found out that it was actually potentially even more interesting because um, you know, as humans, we like to think about what, and look into what makes us special, what makes us different from other creatures. Well, one of the things that makes us unique, as far as I know, in the animal world is that we were the only species parasitized by three different types of lice. Okay, lice are ubiquitous, you know, all mammals have lice, birds have lice, fish have lice, but we alone have three different types of lice. <laughs> Two of these that I'll talk about to start out and then mention the third one later are the head louse, Pediculus capitis, and the body louse, Pediculus humanus, or sometimes also classified as a subspecies of Pediculus capitis. And as you can see, morphologically, they look quite similar. What actually differentiates them is their ecology. So the head louse, as the name suggests, lives and feeds exclusively on the human scalp. Body louse feeds on the body, but actually lives in the clothing and lays its eggs in clothing. And so now you ask yourself, well, how would this difference come about? Why would we have these two different kinds of lice that do these two different things? And the answer that seems to make the most sense is that this ecological difference between head and body louse probably arose when clothing became important in human evolution. And then it became available as a new niche, a new ecological niche that lice could move into and start exploiting and start adapting to and evolve to become body lice. And if that's true, if you buy that, what we can do is use a molecular clock approach and we can date the origin of body lice, the divergence between head and body lice. And by inference, that tells us when clothing became important in human evolution. So what do we need to do the molecular clock 
Well, the molecular clock is a longstanding idea in, in evolutionary genetics. And it goes back to the idea that the rate of evolution, the rate of change of DNA sequences, is approximately constant over time. And this idea is supported by a good deal of observation. So you take pairs of species where you have some idea when they diverge from fossil or biogeographic evidence. You measure the amount of DNA divergence between them, and you plot that. And you see a very strong and astonishingly close correlation between how much divergence there is in DNA sequences and how long ago those two species last shared a common ancestor. It's also supported by theory, but I'll skip over the gory details of that. So what do we need in order to use a molecular clock approach? Well, we need a calibration point. We need to know how fast the clock is ticking. We need to know what is the rate of change in our DNA sequences. And so what we did in order to do this is we assumed that when chimpanzees and humans diverged, chimps being the closest living relative, of humans, so did their lice. So the idea that when hosts diverge, their parasites also diverge, or this coevolution between hosts and parasites, the long-standing observation in biology, there are certainly many exceptions to it, but by and large it is the rule. When hosts speciate, so do their spare parasites. So we therefore can get an idea of how fast the clock is ticking if we can take chimpanzee lice, compare them to human lice, measure their DNA differentiation, and we assume that they, that differentiation occurred about six million years ago. So that then gives us our calibration that tells us how fast the clock is ticking. In addition to do this work, we need our lice samples. So we got head lice and body lice from all different sources around the world. Um, not everyone was uh, uh, pleased to hear from us, and sometimes we got uh, you know, rather indignant responses about how dare we suggest they might have lice at their facility, but nonetheless. We got a good worldwide sample of lice. We also got chimpanzee lice, ridiculous shape eye, from a chimp sanctuary in Uganda. And what is also very important is since we have no clue as to what these things are actually supposed to look like, we had a local expert examine them and confirm that the identifications were indeed correct. So then what we did is we obtained DNA sequences from these lice. We obtained two mitochondrial DNA gene sequences, which gave the same results when analyzed separately. So we combined them, analyzed them together. <coughs> Also, just to make sure that there wasn't something strange about the mitochondrial DNA, we obtained and analyzed sequences of two nuclear genes. And then we did a couple of sanity checks to make sure that the results we were getting sort of corresponded to what we might expect. So one of the things we looked at was the genetic diversity um, in the African lice versus the non-African lice. What you can see is that all of these genes have different amounts of diversity, which is what we always observe because the amount of diversity in a gene is um, a reflection of the functional constraints on that gene. But what we also see is that for each gene, there's more diversity in the African lice than in the non-African lice. And greater diversity implies that's where the source is, that's where the origin is, because you've had the most time to accumulate the most diversity. And that's good, because what this indicates is that um, greater diversity in African lice implies an African origin of human lice. And since that's where we think humans arose, that's a good sanity check. The other check we did on this is to compare the head lice and the body lice. And again, you can see for each of these three genes, more diversity in the head lice than in the body lice. And so that fits with the scenario I told you about, that the body lice are of more recent origin than the head lice. They've had less time to accumulate diversity. So now we can do a phylogenetic analysis, putting together all of these lice sequences using the chimpanzee lice as an outgroup. The H's are the head lice, the B's are the body lice, the numbers in parentheses are the numbers of individual lice that had that particular sequence. And when we apply the molecular clock approach, we see that the clade here that contains all of the body lice sequences, as well as some of the head lice sequences, has an age of about 70,000 years ago, give or take a few tens of thousands of years. And so what we can also see in this tree is that there is a particular clade there which contains all of the body lice, as well as some of the head lice sequences, which has lots and lots of little short branches. And that's a signature of a population expansion. But what we also see in this analysis is evidence for population expansion occurring in lice around this time. So the conclusion we came up with from this study is body lice arose about 70,000 years ago, which then implies that that's when clothing became important in human evolution, provided the niche for body lice to start diverging. Now, how does this compare to archaeological evidence concerning the origin of clothing? Well, clothing itself doesn't 
fossilized. So what we have to do is rely on indirect evidence. And so if we look at the indirect evidence, you know, stone tools and bone tools that would be unequivocally associated with clothing, things like needles, for example, those are on the order of about 40,000 years old at the most. Now, there's certainly other tools around, like scrapers, that potentially could have been used to prepare hides for clothing by scraping them off, but they also could have been used for other purposes. We don't really know for sure what all they were being used for. So the overall conclusion is if we look at the archaeological evidence, it does not contradict a fairly recent origin of clothing, only about, you know, on the order of 70,000 years ago or so. So to summarize the results of this study, we see the body lice originated from head lice, again, 70,000 years ago or so. We see that there's also a population expansion that occurred in lice at right around this time. And while this is all very speculative, what is very tempting to try to relate this to is the expansion of modern humans out of Africa, which has been dated directly from DNA evidence from humans to be between 50 and 100,000 years ago. So it suggests that perhaps it's when humans expanded out of Africa, began growing in size, developed clothing, and that this clothing became available as a niche for the origin of the body lice. So well, what about Neanderthals? You know, whenever you work with modern humans, sooner or later someone will ask you, well, what about Neanderthals? What does this tell us about Neanderthals and other archaic humans? Did they have clothing? Well, this is what we think is the evolutionary relationships of modern humans and Neanderthals. They shared a common ancestor, you know, 600,000 years ago, give or take a few tens of thousands of years. Clothing, if we believe the lice results, originated sometime here around the dispersion of modern humans out of Africa. So this would suggest one of two possibilities for Neanderthals. Either they did not have clothing, or if they did have clothing, they invented it independently of modern humans. In other words, they did not inherit clothing from a common ancestor of Neanderthals and uh, modern humans. Now, there is nothing in what we can infer from the cognitive abilities of Neanderthals, you know, based on the archaeological record and so forth, that would suggest that uh, they were just too stupid to come up with the idea of clothing, right? Certainly quite feasible that they would have come up with the idea of clothing on their own, invented it independently from modern humans. And it certainly is the case that if you look at reconstructions of Neanderthals, they're almost always shown as having clothing. You know, something like this. <laughs> but there's another potential view about what Neanderthals were like. Maybe they were more like this. Now, this is a pair, pretty terrible reconstruction of a Neanderthal from most perspectives. But I show it here because it shows Neanderthals as having body hair, as having retained their body hair. And so that brings up the question, well, when did we actually lose body hair during our evolutionary history? We have no clue about that from fossil evidence. And modern genetics so far has also not been able to come up with an answer. So when did we lose body hair? I mean, if we lost body hair recently, maybe Neanderthals still had body hair. Maybe then, therefore, when they moved out of Africa into the colder climates, they didn't need clothing because they already had their body hair. And there's lots of other mammals that moved out of Africa at the same time. They didn't invent clothing. They got along perfectly well without it. So that brings up the question, when did we lose our body hair? And a potential answer from that comes from the third type of lice that we have. That's this lovely creature here. This is a pubic louse. Pubic lice, as their name suggests, they live and feed exclusively in the pubic region. And as I already told you, the head lice live and feed exclusively on the scalp. And now you ask yourself, well, how would this difference come about between these two different types of lice? And the answer that seems to make sense is that, you know, at one time we had body hair, we had hair all over us, we had one type of lice, and then we lost body hair, so that we only have hair in the pubic region and in the head region. And now we have a barrier that the lice can't cross. And so we have geographic isolation, we get classic <laughs> allopatric speciation, and now we have our two types of lice. Well, again, if you buy that, then we can use the molecular clock approach and ask, when did the difference between pubic and head, head, uh, head lice occur and date that divergence? And that might tell us something about when humans then lost their body hair. Now, that all sounds very nice and neat. However, it's not quite that simple. Life is never that simple. So here's the view of lice evolution that I just told you about, going back as far as the gorilla lineage now. So the gorilla lineage branched off before the chimp and the human lineages. But if we start with the gorilla lineage, we have a ch common ancestor, gorillas, chimps, and humans. The gorilla lineage branches off. That leads to the evolution of the gor gorilla louse. 
chimp lineage branches off. That leads to the differentiation of chimp lice and the origin of all human lice. We then have loss of body hair. That leads to the origin of the pubic louse. And finally, we have clothing. And that leads to the origin of the body louse, separate from the head louse. That looks all very reasonable. However, the com complication is that the taxonomy, classical taxonomy of lice, does not agree with this. So the classical taxonomy um, looks at things this way. Body louse, it's in the genus Pediculus, as I've told you, as is the head louse, as is the chimpanzee louse. But the pubic louse is put into a different genus by the taxonomist. It's the genus Therus. And that is the same genus, the gorilla louse. So I will refrain from any speculation as to how <laughs> humans might have gotten pubic lice from gorillas. But one possibility is that the taxonomy based on morphology is wrong, right? There are many examples we know where taxonomy based on morphology differs from that based on the DNA. So clearly what we need is DNA evidence to see what's going on here. And we also need DNA from gorilla lice to see what's going on here. And David Reed's group at Florida did just that and found that, lo and behold, the taxonomy is supported by the DNA. You get the same picture from the DNA. And when did this divergence between human pubic lice and gorilla lice occur? About 3.3 million years ago. And so if you believe that this colonization, this transfer, from gorillas to humans would have occurred only after humans would have lost their body hair, which I think is probably the most reasonable scenario, then that would suggest that body hair loss occurred relatively early on in human evolution, not too long after the divergence from the chimp lineage, which fits with some other ideas that people have had about loss of body hair. And so it would appear that our ancestors do have some <laughs> explaining to do to us. So to conclude, <laughs> genetic analyses of head and body lice do indicate that clothing became important somewhere around 70,000 years ago. It seems to coincide with the expansion of modern humans out of Africa. Maybe had something to do with that expansion. Genetic analyses of pubic lice suggest our ancestors had lost their body hair by roughly 3.3 3 million years ago, not so long after their divergence from chimpanzees, so it was relatively early on. Ellen, with the acknowledgments, especially went to single out Ralph Kittler and Manfred Kaiser, the two people, people in my group who did the work we've done on lice, and all these other people for contributing samples, um, not necessarily their own lice samples, of course, <laughs> and the Mox Planck Society for funding all of our work. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>